Do you see my Zoom page or do you see my presentation? I see your presentation and I'm so excited to see so many people from around the world. Someone popping in from the Ukraine. Oh my goodness. So many, so many fun people. <laughs> oh, And lots of our lovely locals who care about Great Salt Lake and want to hear about the Dead Sea. Okay, good. Technical difficulties over. That's the end of it. And now we don't have to have any more. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, another installation of Salty Shorts. Uh, we started this um, during lunchtime meetings, and we hope they inspire you to go to your favorite Salt Lake and get your shorts salty. Um, first of all, in, in the bottom corner, you can see a, a QR code to links and resources. I will also link to that in the chat. This is just a compilation of lots of resources that we've been um, directing people to um, over this Salty Science series. Um, um, all of this will be recorded and put on our Great Salt Lake Institute YouTube page. You can go to the QR code. And I really like to use um, playlists. And so all of our pages are going to be um, listed, uh, are going to be organized by these playlists um, that, that just kind of help you find things. Um, I want you to be aware of the next Salty Shorts is actually on Saturday, February 19th at 10 a.m. with Representative Tim Hawks. He um, has some bills that he's working on through this legislative session um, and, and will be talking to us about an update. You can register at the QR code that's on your screen. Um, also on February 19th will be a reading of um, poet Nan Seymour's uh, poem, um, collective praise poem about Great Salt Lake called Irreplaceable. Um, it's going to be 1700 lines that is collected from every anybody that will give her lines. Um, the reason it's 1700 lines is um, that's what she envisions uh, restored the surface area of a restored Great Salt Lake to be 1700 square miles. Um, I will be reading so um, come and join us uh, for Irreplaceable. Um, I think tomorrow is pretty cool. Um, up at the uh, Utah Capitol, there's um, going to be some bills that are introduced about Great Salt Lake and getting water to Great Salt Lake because, you know, right now we're all very worried about that. You can link and actually watch these the session, the House um, Natural Resources Committee um, tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Uh, will be um, discussing those bills. The only correction that I need to make though is we had to cancel, you'll see on number six, House Bill 298, the state crustacean designation. We had to cancel that until next week because of COVID, darn COVID has prevented us from um, presenting that tomorrow. What it does mean is that you have an opportunity to sign this petition for the sixth graders in Mr. Craner's um, class at Emerson Elementary, and you can sign this petition and tell our legislators that we would really love for brand shrimp to be the official Utah State crustacean. Um, and I will link to that when they finally are able to um, present. So um, I would love to I would love to really get to, you know, why we're here and what we're doing here today. Um, this year, we saw Great Salt Lake um, have the very lowest low lake elevations that we've ever seen by far. And um, we have done a lot of work, you know, writing a biology book and editing a biology book about a terminal lake in a time of change and thinking about locally. And this year, I think we wanted to step outside of Utah with these salty shorts and invite our friends from other countries um, who have an experienced lakes like Great Salt Lake um, that are shrinking. And 
So today we're really excited to have Dr. Aaron Oren, who is a professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in the Division of Microbial and Molecular Ecology Department um, of Plant and Environmental Sciences and the Institute of Life Sciences. His research includes adaptation of microorganisms to life at high salt concentrations, physiology, biochemistry, and taxonomy of halophilic microorganisms, the micro microbial ecology of solar salterns, the microbiology of the Dead Sea and prokaryotic Pro, and prokaryote taxonomy and nomenclature. And I just have to say that his um, CV that he sent me is like 87 pages long. And um, trying to distill that into a little bio was really, really, really hard. So um, I don't think I can say enough about Dr. Oren and the work that he has been doing at the Dead Sea. And today he's going to tell us about that 2000 year history of the rise and fall of the Dead Sea. So thank you for joining us. Okay. Let's see if I can share this one. You can see it? Yeah, it looks great. Okay. Um, good. Let's get started then. Thanks very, very much for inviting me. Uh, you know that I'm a great fan of Ray Salt Lake and I have uh, joined many of your presentations. And uh, to give me the opportunity to tell a little bit about the lake where my halo file study started. I'm a microbiologist and today I'm not talking microbiology, but I'm going to do other things that I quite like. So I hope that uh, you will enjoy what I'm going to present to you the rise and fall of the Dead Sea. Um, let's start like this. I live in Jerusalem, which is uh, located in the mountains about at an elevation of about 800 meters above mean sea level. When I drive to the Dead Sea, it takes me about 25 minutes to get to the lowest point on earth. I have a steep descent from plus 800 meters to uh, more than 400 meters below mean sea level. Uh, so uh, that is what I can tell you if I say it in a si simple words. Now, some like poetry, and I understand that uh, Bonnie and Jamie are also poetically inclined. So you can also say the, these, these things in a poetic way. Uh, Let's read the, those lines. Jerusalem, the mountain town, is based how far above the sea, but down a lead line's long reach down a deep sea land beneath the zone of ocean level, heaven's decree has sunk the pool whose deep submerged the doomed Pentapolis fire scorched. Pentapolis is the five cities, Dom, Gomorra, Adama, Zeboim, and Zohar, that were destroyed at the time of Abraham the Patriarch. So let's start with a little quiz then. I like these kind of questions. Does anyone recognize or have a guess which famous author and poet wrote those lines? Put your answer in the uh, uh, question and answers or in the chat box, and we will discuss the uh, answer at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the talk. I'm curious if anyone can guess who wrote those nice lines. So, Let's start this virtual tour by driving indeed to the Dead Sea. I will arrive somewhere here at the northern end. And when I then drive along the lake, quite uh, quickly, I encounter a place where there is this little sign board in green. Uh, the road here is situated about 394 meters below sea level. I apologize that I think metrically and not in feet like the American friends do. So from time to time, I will add the uh, feet and inches, etc., cetera, uh, terms as well. But this sign points to a line here that's carved in the rock, uh, this red line, and below it, the initials PEF. So what does it mean? The sign that is here uh, put on the near the road uh, tells a, a few details. 
I, I guess that only few of few people know about this for everyone who drives along it just uh, never stops here. There is not even a decent place to park your car there. So uh, most Israelis will not know this. So when I then read this sign, which was put up by the Israel Nature and Parks Authority, it says PEF rock, observation rock, uh, between the years 1900 to 1913, and again in 1917, the Palestine Exploration Fund, PEF, measured the water level of the Dead Sea using this rock. The red paint marked uh, the water level as it was a century ago, can still be seen today. PEF, this Palestine Exploration Fund, uh, is a learned society that was founded in Britain in, six, in 1865. It still exists, it's still active. Uh, so you can check their website uh, to see what they are doing today uh, in our area. So this green sign near the road is one uh, piece of information that you can get. When you uh, check the internet and try to find more uh, information about this uh, PEF rock, you find information that's quite different. For example, I found this text in 1913, here it was 1900, here's 1913, an expedition sailed to the northern shores to extem examine the constant drop of the Dead Sea. Coming near a big protruding rock next to the springs of Infestra, they marked a line 50 centimeters above the surface, so not at the water level, but 57, 50 centimeters below, and engraved the initials of the fund PEF underneath. So these are two different sources. And it's amazing to see that nearly everything you read here is wrong. First of all, let's start with the internet. It was not in, carved in 1913, but in 1900. It was at the period that the level was the highest in uh, almost 2000 years and there was no drop at all. And the li line was not 50 centimeters above the surface. Uh, also, the official uh, information that uh, is uh, from the government agency is also wrong. It says marking the water level as it was, nothing of the kind. If you want the good information, don't trust the internet, even don't trust your government, go to the source and let's read then the source. This is the source uh, where it all started. Robert McAllister of the Palestine Exploration Fund reported in the official journal of this uh, organization, observation of dead sea levels, Mr. McAllister reports. After a short search, I succeeded in finding a rock which combines all the requisite characteristics for selection. It is a boulder standing sheer out of the water to a height of about 20 feet with a smaller rock in front of it that affords convenient standing ground for taking observa observations. Uh, I caused a stonemason to make uh, on the face, uh, a mark uh, on the face of the, of the rock. Um, so um, this mark is a horizontal line with the initials PEF beneath it, the line at the time when it was cut was exactly 14 feet, which means more than four meters above the sur surface of the sea. It means then that the surface was not at that line above, but at about the level of the road today. So this is what the, the source uh, says. And then uh, Mr. McAllister ends, this may be taken as the first observation of the contemplated series. And indeed, this is what happened. For if you then check the pages of the Palestine Exploration Fund quarterly, you find uh, April 1908 measurements at the observation rock that showed a rise since previous November of two feet, three and a half inches. Spring visit in 1912. Um, at the, uh, the measurement at the PEF rock was 11 feet, five and a half inches, a rise of two feet since the autumn. Animal life, two gazelles, a hare, sand partridges, storks, and wood pigeons. So this is the kind of information that was published then uh, almost twice a year. 
Uh, and uh, this doctor, Masterman, uh, medical doctor from Jerusalem, who made those visits twice uh, yearly, uh, in 1913, he summarized the data. First of all, you have here a nice picture photograph of the rock itself. It was approached not by land, but by a little boat from the lake itself. And here you see one of the uh, scientists with the tape measure from the uh, sign measuring how deep the uh, lake is below. And the graph that they published, which is a nice snapshot of the history of the Dead Sea from the year 1900 when the uh, uh, line was cut until 1913, shows fluctuations, of course, in winter, the level increases because of the rain. In summer, you have excess evaporation and you get a decrease. In the first year, there was a, a, a decrease of about uh, two feet or so, so uh, 60, 60, 70 centimeters. Then it rose again. So you had these fluctuations, which were plus minus <clears throat> uh, one or two meters during these uh, 13 years, 14 years. So this is then the starting point of a broader discussion, what happened before, what happened after, and uh, where are we now? So let's start now from the real, from the basics and explain a little bit what the Dead Sea is, where it comes from. Um, and uh, when I think about a good map of our area that explains a lot of data, uh, this is still my favorite picture. It was taken by uh, Charles Conrad and Richard, uh, uh, and, and Richard Gordon, the two astronauts from the Jimmy 11 capsule in 1966. Uh, and it shows the Middle East, Mediterranean Sea, Red Sea, uh, Africa, Egypt here, uh, Saudi Arabia here, Sinai Peninsula, and uh, the place where I live and work, Jerusalem, here in the mountains. Uh, and it shows nice this valley that starts here in the north via Lake Kinneret, the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea, the Arava Valley, uh, the Gulf of Aqaba, Gulf of Elat. On the other side, you have the Gulf of Suez and the Suez Canal here. So this is the geographical setting where we thought what we're talking about. Um, the way geologists look at this, uh, the fact that the Dead Sea is so low, it's all a matter of plate tectonics. We are here in an area that is tectonically very active. Um, we have the uh, Syria-Israel plate where we are here. We have the African plate. We have the Jordan-Arabia plate. And these plates are still moving. In fact, these two plates here uh, move still at a rate of about two centimeters every hundred years. And uh, this rift valley that uh, includes then the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea, uh, the Gulf of Aqaba, and the Red Sea itself, uh, this is then the way it was uh, formed and uh, it still changes. I also We'll need later uh, the political situation. So let's have a, a look at the political map here. Uh, we have the state of Israel. Jerusalem is here in the mountains. Um, we have at the eastern side, the kingdom of Jordan. Uh, we have also the West Bank, the Palestinian Authority that uh, uh, rules uh, this area, including part of the Dead Sea coast. And we will also need uh, the contribution of Syria in this for Syria is also in part inside the watershed of the Dead Sea. So we have different countries and interesting politics here in the area. And most of you will be aware of the political situation here. Now, if I look at uh, satellite picture, I think this was taken uh, directly from Google Earth. It shows uh, what it all looks like today. Uh, the Dead Sea, um, the northern part, 
Northern Basin, as I will call it later then, is deep. It's a deep lake. The maximum depth today about this area here is about 290 meters. Um, bordering Israel, sorry, uh, the uh, Palestinian Authority and Jordan. And in the south, we have uh, sets of evaporation ponds uh, that were built there by industries that uh, extract different minerals from the lake. We have the Dead Sea Works at the Israeli site. We have the Arab Potash uh, Company at the Jordanian site. So all this southern part today has nothing to do with the Dead Sea proper, but it's a set of industrial evaporation ponds to extract minerals like potassium, potassium chloride, uh, like bromine, like magnesium, and also some kitchen salts and sodium chloride. Okay, um, the lake as we see it now is a remainder of a much larger lake that was called Lake Lisan uh, during the Pleistocene, which is a peak at about 20,000 years before present. Now, to you people in uh, Utah, this will sound very familiar. For you see uh, Great Salt Lake as a remnant of uh, Lake Bonneville in the Pleistocene, which was much larger at much uh, higher level than your uh, um, Great Salt Lake today. Here we have exactly the same. We had a much larger lake uh, that at some time was even connected to the Med Mediterranean. And this uh, connection was then uh, uh, ended uh, and the whole thing started to dry up so that today we have only the freshwater lake of the Sea of Galilee and we have the hypersaline Dead Sea and connecting them is the Jordan River. Um, geologists can tell a lot about what uh, Lake Lisan looked like and the level of the water during different periods. I must admit, I'm a lousy geologist, so I cannot uh, claim that I understand everything that geologists tell us. But according to this scheme, uh, which is, I think, one of the best updated ones, the highest level ever reached was about 160 meters below sea level. And that means uh, nearly 300 meters above the present level of the Dead Sea. Today, we are here. So this is what the geologists tell us. Um, the last uh, pictures uh, in this series is uh, a picture of the watershed of the Dead Sea. Where does the water come from today? Um, because of the low elevation also of Lake Kinera, the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, the uh, watershed is in fact quite extensive, but our area is arid, it's dry. So the amount of fresh water that naturally gets into uh, uh, Lake Kinera, uh, the Jordan River and the Dead Sea is in fact quite limited. Another interesting feature, and here the Dead Sea is very different from your Great Salt Lake, is the fact that it's a deep lake. Uh, the, as I said already, the maximum depth is about 290 meters. Um, the uh, shores are very steep, so only a few meters, a few kilo, uh, meters uh, from the lake, you are already in deep waters. And um, the Dead Sea is, the level is now decreasing very rapidly, as I will document in a few minutes. Um, but if I look at the surface of the lake, um, the lake in the 1930s, which is the contours, including the, uh, the green part, um, compare this to 1975, which is without the green, and compare it with the uh, situation today, which is about this area only, the difference are not so big. If you have only a few feet of uh, increase or decrease in Great Salt Lake, you have a tremendous uh, change in the uh, contours of the lake on the, the map on the surface, 
the Dead Sea is different. Um, another interesting feature of the uh, Dead Sea, also because of it was at least such a deep lake, is the fact that this lake was stratified. Uh, the uh, the um, upper layers of the uh, water were less saline than the lower uh, layers. This scheme, I derived this from a comprehensive study by the Geological Survey of Israel, 1959-1960. Um, it was shown that the upper 40 meters of the water column uh, was about 10% less saline than the lower water mass down to the bottom. So this means that because of the lower salinity, the upper 40 meters never mixed with the deeper layer. Uh, linologists will call this a monomictic lake. Um, uh, on um, uh, Meomictic lake, sorry. Um, and this situation of two layers existed at least 400 years. For uh, we can uh, already find uh, very clear evidence for this in the exploration of the Dead Sea in 1864 by a very rich French uh, nobleman, Honoré Duc de Luin, uh, who sailed the Dead Sea in 1864. He also visited Petra. He made a very uh, extensive exploration tour of the area. And as this uh, person was very rich, he built for himself custom-made a nine and a half meter long sailing yacht, uh, which was uh, built in pieces so that they could be transported to the Dead Sea on the back of camels and then assembled at the Dead Sea. So the Segor, his uh, boat, he brought it to the Dead Sea. Uh, and with this boat, he sailed the lake. You can see here all these red lines is the uh, trajectory uh, which the Duc de Luin and his crew uh, sailed the lake. One of the members of this crew, his, in fact, his chief scientist, was uh, Louis Lartet, at the time 24 years old, a brilliant geologist. He became later very famous because of he discovered the skeletons of the Cro-Magnon uh, uh, men, uh, so paleontology. And uh, Louis Lartet had this beautiful device to take samples from deeper waters. It was based on a, a tube here that was filled with mercury. And this inverted tube could then be inverted to, uh, by remote control to be inverted. The mercury flows out to a container here. The tube itself is filled then with water from the side. And then you can pull up the whole device and uh, analyze the water. I took the data from Louis Lartet and I draw from here uh, a profile of the density of the water, specific gravity of the water at different depths at two uh, sampling stations. And here again, you see that the upper 50 meters are less saline than the lower waters. In fact, the salinity at the top was only about 70% of the salinity down. So at the time, the stratification already existed, but uh, because of the lake started to dry out very drastically during the 20th century, the salinity of the upper layers increased and increased until in February 1979, uh, the entire water column mixed. So today, this stratification does no longer exist. So I uh, told you that I'm going to concentrate on the last 2000 years of the history of the lake. And uh, let's start with this uh, re reconstructed uh, level of the, uh, of the water in these 2000 years. Uh, so it's about this area here. You can see that this peak here, that is when the PEF mark was carved in the lake, was in fact the maximum. 
Um, and I want to try to document with you some of the other data points that are here. Um, and you will see that the documentation comes from all kinds of different sources. Let's start here at the shore near Kidron, a picture that I took from Google Earth again. You can see nearly everything on uh, Google Earth. This is the road along the lake. And here you have an uh, ancient ruin. When you uh, stand on the road and you photograph this place, it looks like this. Um, the place is called Kirbet Mazin. And archaeologists could date this also because of coins and other findings to about 100 uh, before the Common Era. So uh, the time of the Hasmonean uh, King Alexander Yanai. Now, what was it? What it was, you can very nicely see when you go around and look from the other side. It was a, a, a shipyard. It was built for constructing and repairing ships. And you have this ramp from the building itself to the lake. Uh, about ships on the Dead Sea and uh, navigation on the Dead Sea. I have a separate lecture. Maybe I can uh, give you that story one day for there are some interesting features there as well. So the level of this ramp is about uh, 395 meters. So it means that uh, when this was built more than 2000 years ago, the level was uh, at least four meters below uh, the uh, PEF mark uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and uh, artist uh, reconstruction of what this uh, shipyard looked like uh, at the time itself, it's something like this, uh, with again the ramp where the ships were pulled up and uh, could be uh, repaired uh, at, at the site. Another piece of evidence, uh, I'm not even sure that I can call this real evidence, but I like this. Um, written documents. Flavius Josephus, um, people in Israel know very well who he is, uh, others may be less familiar with him. So let me tell a few words about who Flavius Josephus was. He was a Jewish military man who uh, during the war between the Jews and the Romans, the war that's ended more or less at uh, 70, uh, the year 70 when Jerusalem, when Jerusalem was conquered by the Romans. Uh, in the beginning, he fought uh, with the Israeli uh, army, uh, but the Jewish army, but uh, then he saw that uh, we are going to lose. So he defected to the Roman camp. Uh, and he later became a Roman. And after he moved to Rome, he wrote the history of the Jewish people and the history of the Jewish war um, to a great extent to justify his uh, treason, the way he defected to the Romans. So Flavius Josephus was very well acquainted with the uh, area. When I consult Flavius Josephus, I like to uh, not to read it in the original uh, uh, language, which is Greek, but I have my own copy of the Josephus, the complete works of Josephus, a beautiful book that I have here at home. Uh, it was printed in Dordrecht in the Netherlands in 1665. And it contains the works of Josephus in a Dutch translation. So let's read two sentences from this book, uh, what Josephus can tell us about the Dead Sea. Dit meer heeft 580 stadien in de lengte, als dat zich tot Zoara in Arabië toe uitstrekt, maar in de breedte heeft het 150 stadien. So this lake is uh, 580 stadia long, and uh, extends uh, to Zoara in Arabia, uh, but uh, the uh, width uh, is 150 stadia. So how to translate this in uh, present day uh, uh, dimensions? 
580 by 150 stadia. One stadium in the Roman times is said to be about 157 meters or uh, 0.1 mile. So this would translate to 99 kilometers uh, length and 23 kilometers in width. Now, this is utterly impossible for uh, because of the mountains are so steep, uh, a width of 23 kilometers means that the level should have been a few hundred meters above the present day level. On the other hand, if I take those dimensions and uh, calculate the ratio between the length and the width, then I get 3.9 to 1, which is ex very close to the northern basin, 3.5 to 1. So if this is true, and Josephus was exact, at least in the dimensions, what you had at this time is a Dead Sea that is smaller than today and is only what today is the northern basin without the area of the evaporation points. Now I go 500 years later, uh, and for the next piece of evidence, I go to Jordan, to the town of Madaba, which is located very close to the Dead Sea, um, in a church that was uh, renovated in the 1890s. It was discovered that the floor is a mosaic that has a beautiful map of the entire Holy Land. Um, and I show you now the part of the Dead Sea in this map. Haluke, he kai asphaltitis limne, he kai negra talassa. So uh, the salt lake or the asphalt lake or the Dead Sea, it gives the explanations in Greek. It shows a nice picture of the Dead Sea. It shows the Jordan River. Here you have Jerusalem, which uh, was depicted very detailed. Um, we have here the hot springs at the Dead Sea area and everything that uh, is related to this map. It's clear that the mosaic artist knew the area very, very well. What is missing here is this peninsula in the middle. What is missing is this division into the north uh, basin uh, and the southern basin. Uh, and if you then measure the dimensions here, you get 3.6 to 1, which is exactly the dimensions of the northern basin, 3.5 to 1. So again, all evidence points that also uh, during this Byzantine period, 560 AD, uh, when it was uh, uh, estimated that this mosaic was made, the Dead Sea level was low. A nice detail, and I will get to this back to this at the end of the talk, uh, of the Madaba map is the uh, place where the Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea. You have two fishes here. One fish is swimming southwards to the Dead Sea. The fish that is close to the Dead Sea and gets into the, in touch with the very salty waters here tries to turn around for the Dead Sea is not a proper place to be uh, for a fish, of course. So, um, the last 200 years. We have already seen around 1900 when the PEF mark was carved. What happened then? We know today the level is going down and down and today we are all the way down here. But uh, we have also quite a lot of evidence what happened in the 19th century, for example. And to show you only one uh, nice uh, document, this is uh, the travel log of uh, a British Navy officer, uh, Charles Leonard Arby, here shown in very beautiful, expensive Egyptian garb to, uh, at an Egyptian temple, which he saw. Um, and um, Irby and Mangles, who uh, uh, described this area and toured the area in 1818, uh, they drew the first, let's say, modern map of the Dead Sea. And this shows very nicely the northern basin, the deep part, 
uh, it shows the southern basin and this Lisan Peninsula. Uh, and we can very clearly uh, know that at that time, the level of the lake was 402 meters below sea level because the uh, uh, people could pass and animals could pass through this shallow water. It was a fort. Uh, and um, reading what uh, Erbian Mangles then uh, writes, uh, just as we arrived at the narrowest part where the fort is indicated by borrowing of trees, we observed the small caravan from Kerak landed on the opposite side. And as we could discern the species of animal as well as the people on their backs, we were all agreed in estimating the distance about a mile. As there were asses on the party, the depths cannot be great. So if a donkey could uh, cross, then the level was clearly uh, 400 meters, 402 meters below sea level. So since those times, and here again, an old atlas uh, that showed the northern basin, the peninsula, and the southern basin, to the situation today where you have only the northern basin and the entire part here is evaporation ponds of the industries, you have a very dramatic decrease. And this is due to the fact, and here I'm uh, telling stories that you people in Utah know exactly uh, the same for, uh, you have exact parallels for what happened uh, in, in Utah, that fresh water sources are diverted for agriculture, for drinking water, and as little as possible, fresh water uh, reached the Dead Sea. So in the 1950s, uh, Israel built this national water carrier that pumps water from the Sea of Galilee uh, and supplies or at least supplied at the time, most of our drinking water. So less and less water is starting to flow through the Jordan River to the Dead Sea. At the Jordanian side, exactly the same was done. The Jordanians dammed the Yarmouk River and built this King Abdullah Canal for the same purposes. And as a result, the amount of water, of fresh water that flowed through the Jordan River to the Dead Sea decreased very dramatically. In addition, these industrial uh, ponds for evaporation and uh, extraction of salts and uh, other minerals also pump water out of the lake. And it's quite clear that the contribution of the uh, industries to the decrease in the lake level is about 20% of the total. So today, let's uh, in, then focus on the, uh, the recent years, the uh, meters below sea level years, on the average, the level is going down by one meter or a little bit over one meter even each year. And today uh, we are somewhere here, here down. So we are losing about one meter every year. Sometimes you have a special rainy winter in 1991, 1992 was one. The 1980 winter was wet, but overall you have this very steep decrease. And you can see this when you travel along the lake, you see these terraces here. Every terrace is another year uh, and you can just date uh, 10 years ago, the level was here, 20 years ago, the level was there, et cetera, et cetera. The industry um, uh, that uh, operates these evaporation ponds in the south, also the Israeli side, also at the Jordanian side, uh, this was established in the 1930s by a Siberian mining engineer, Mikhail or Moshe uh, Novomesky, uh, who uh, started to extract minerals, potassium chloride, uh, especially uh, in evaporation pond in the, in the north. Uh, then later the operation was moved to the south. And uh, he gives a very nice description of the uh, initial years of the uh, uh, industry, the struggle for the Dead Sea concession in a book 
that's entitled Given to Salt. Where this title comes from, I will show you at the end. So today, the Dead Sea Works is a huge operation. Uh, the main product is potassium chloride, potash. Uh, a second product that they make is bromine. The bromine plant supplies about 40% of the world supply of bromine. Um, there is a plant to produce elemental magnesium and uh, also uh, some uh, kitchen salt, so the chloride halide is also gained. So um, as a result of all this agriculture, drinking water industry, uh, the level is going very quickly down. And this can be very impressive. Here, this picture published in 2010 shows a, a dock for a boat that was built in 2007. So just three years before that. And in three years, you see the amount, the level decrease. If today you come back to the same site, uh, you will see this uh, place of the dock here, and the level is way down. This picture was taken by Terry McGenity from Essex, uh, UK. Terry is in the audience here, uh, and I thank him for this uh, nice picture. Uh, this uh, mooring site was built uh, in 1996 for a tourist boat uh, for touristic cruises on the lake. This boat has only a very short life. For uh, five years later, it was beached in the storm and uh, not, not very much was left of it. So you see how dramatic this decrease is in just uh, 25 years, what the Dead Sea has been doing. And uh, another side effect of this is the appearance all over the place, also at the Israeli side, also at the Jordanian side, of sinkholes. The whole infrastructure is literally collapsing. You have these big holes, these big sinkholes that are formed. And there are many pictures like this that suddenly the whole ground collapses and you have these uh, big uh, gaps here. Uh, here, a truck that uh, got caught in such a sinkhole. Uh, this was once uh, a holiday resort on the beach. Now uh, it's just dangerous to walk there and to see what happens. Uh, some of the sinkholes also become nicely colored because of microbes, but I told you I'm not going to talk about microbes today. So this is a different story. Now, how does this, uh, this is work? Where do they come from? It's like this because of uh, the previous situation that you had the Lake Lisan at a high level, which dried out to the present Dead Sea, you had massive uh, um, precipitation of salt. And uh, in the bottom area uh, of the, in the area, you have deposits of salt, halide, sodium chloride, so kitchen salt. And as long as the level of the Dead Sea was high, Everything was fine for the fresh water in the ground of the groundwater from the mountains did not get close to the salt layer, the salt layer. And the salt layer was just uh, in the, at the level of the highly saline the Dead Sea water. When the Dead Sea decreased, then also the fresh water from the uh, runoff from the mountains uh, got into deeper layers, got in touch with the salt layer here below and started to dissolve the salt. So you have these cavities formed until at the end, the whole thing collapses and um, the result is just one big disaster. As a result, there are no, in fact, no real public beaches on the Northern end of the Dead Sea any longer for everything is just too dangerous to walk. And today, if I want to drive from the north to the south along the, uh, the Dead Sea, this is the road as it was. This is a bridge that was just renovated about 10 years ago uh, over this dry riverbed. 
today uh, we have sinkholes uh, that make this road too dangerous. Also, uh, date palm growth uh, here had to be abundant. And today, drivers have to make a, a de detour in order to get back to the road and not to uh, sink in these uh, sinkhole areas. So this is the kind of problems that the Dead Sea is facing. Hmm. This is an interesting one. I found this in uh, a newspaper in 1993. And when you look at this, you have a paradox here. For if I read this, looking for high ground, the water keeps rising at the lowest place on earth. And here, the next page then, uh, the beach of Moria Plaza, the, the hotels near the Dead Sea, was raised by two meters in the early 1980s. Uh, if no measures are taken, the lobby will soon be underwater. So something doesn't sound right here. If I explain to you that the level of the, the Dead Sea is decreasing by one meter per year, what does it mean here that it's increasing? So to solve the paradox, let's look at the map again. These hotels are not situated at the Dead Sea proper, but they are, dead, they are located at the industrial evaporation ponds here in Imbokek. The tourists think they swim in the Dead Sea. No, they swim in an in, in, in industrial evaporation pond. And these evaporation ponds, the first ones, uh, precipitate sodium chloride. So in order to gain the more valuable uh, minerals in the south, just simple kitchen salt accumulates here at the rate of 20 centimeters per year. Uh, and if you do not do anything, those hotels indeed will get flooded. Um, today, uh, they started to mechanically scrape off much of the salt in order to finally deposit it uh, uh, on the bottom of the northern end. Um, but uh, this uh, newspaper item that I found uh, just a, a month ago, how Israel intentionally destroyed the Dead Sea. Everyone laments the vanishing of the Dead Sea, uh, yet discussions, articles, and forecasts of decades ago show that every stage of the sea's demise was actually anticipated in advance. The owners of the hotels knew already in the 1970s that things are going to happen and uh, it will not be sustainable. And every, everyone said, okay, everything will be okay. Uh, so, uh, but now people are in trouble. A few final slides. What can we expect in the future? Where are we going here? The first scenario is, of course, if we have no further human interference, then the level will keep dropping uh, as it drops now about one meter per year. But, and this is very different from the situation that you have in uh, Great Salt Lake, the lake will not dry out. Um, and the reason why uh, Great Salt Lake can dry up, but the Dead Sea cannot, is the difference in uh, chemical composition of the lake. Great Salt Lake is mainly sodium chloride, so a composition that's very similar to seawater. The Dead Sea has relatively little sodium chloride. It has lots of magnesium. It has lots of calcium. And if you take uh, these magnesium and calcium salts and dry them out, you uh, get a brine that is very hygroscopic, that had uh, uh, in physical chemistry, you will, will call this the water activity that is much lower than the water activity of uh, uh, sodium chloride brine. It means that uh, such brines will attract water instead of losing water. And this has all been modeled. And the uh, conclusion is that um, you can uh, get an, a drop of another 80 or 90 meters below what we have today. 
but then you will have an equilibrium between evaporation and uh, um, um, uh, hygroscopic effect of the salts. And um, so the um, and when you then predict what the Dead Sea will look like. The contours are not very different from those today because of the very steep slopes. If you go 100 meters deeper than today, you still have a substantial lake that, you, that will be left. So the Dead Sea will not dry up, at least if the climatic conditions will remain as they are today. But you can also think about human interference to restore the level of the Dead Sea. And I will just do this very shortly. Um, I go back here to a sketch that was made by a French Swiss uh, um, hydrologist, Max Burkhardt, who uh, toured the area and uh, explored the hydrology of the area. And he came with the idea that the Dead Sea minus 394 meters. Uh, it's interesting. This is one year before the PEF mark was called was carved. So I said the what, the road was uh, minus 394. This is exactly what uh, Burkhardt uh, then uh, says. Um, if you connect the Dead Sea with the Mediterranean by means of a canal here you can gain hydroelectric energy and exploiting this difference in elevation of almost 400 meters. Uh, Burkhardt even uh, uh, predicted how many horsepowers you can generate at different uh, hydroelectric power plants on the way. And while doing this, you refill the Dead Sea and you get a larger Dead Sea than uh, was there was then. Now, this idea has been revived in the 1970s and 1980s uh, when the price of oil uh, started to rise quite drastically. Uh, and then our government uh, was really serious in uh, the, uh, uh, trying to implement this idea of connecting the Dead Sea, low here, with the Mediterranean, this time, uh, okay, by means of a tunnel or, or a canal. And establishing a hydroelectric power plant. This appeared to be not feasible. Uh, and also uh, because of the Dead Sea is not only Israel, it was also Jordan. Uh, the Jordanians uh, were not happy with this. Uh, but then later, uh, the World Summit on Sustainable Development, Johannesburg 2002, uh, the Israelis and the Jordanians came together and they revived this old idea of connecting the Dead Sea, this time not with the Mediterranean, but with the Red Sea in the south. Uh, Israel and Jordan agreed plan to save the Dead Sea. Dead Sea Rescue Plan unveiled. Uh, and the idea was then a canal from the Red Sea in the south to the Dead Sea hydroelectric power plants uh, using the, the energy for water desalination. The Jordanians need the fresh water much more than, than we do. We need them. So this was uh, revived again um, after 2006. It was also a good reason why to uh, investigate again whether this all can be done. Uh, a big uh, study was published. I was also part of the crew that uh, published this report. Red Sea, Dead Sea Water Conveyance Study Program, August 2011, by people from the Geological Survey, different universities, uh, Institute of Life Sciences, uh, University of, of Jerusalem, that's me. Um, so a lot of basic studies were, were made. The bottom line of all this, is that today this program is dead. Today, uh, also the Jordanians are no longer pushing this. Um, they prefer cheaper and simpler solutions to get the drinking water. So I do not expect that such a plan will ever get implemented. 
but we still should be optimistic about the future of the Dead Sea. And uh, to show why, this was uh, published already two and a half thousand years ago in a publication that uh, may not be, uh, let's say, a peer reviewed uh, article, but still it's a publication with very high impact. And the text I'm referring to is this. For those of you who can not understand this text, I give you the English translation. This is from chapter 47 from the book published by Ezekiel the prophet. Um, okay, and these waters go down into the desert and go into the sea, and the waters shall be healed, and it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, with moveth, where, where, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live, and there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because of these waters shall come thither, and the lake shall be healed, uh, and everything shall live where the, the, the river come. Uh, and there will be fishermen. Remember those fish that I showed you uh, trying to enter the Dead Sea. Now they will uh, have a good opportunity to live. But the miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. Uh, compare this again with your situation in Great Salt Lake. You have a hopefully healthy Great Salt Lake and next to it, you have the, uh, the salt places that are given to salt, the salt flats of Bonneville, which will not be healed. And now you also understand where Moshe Novomesky got the title of his book, Given to Salt. It is from this uh, verse from the book of Ezekiel. So I think this is the, my message uh, for today. And um, I'm, of course, ready to uh, listen to, uh, to hear your questions. I want to show one more slide, uh, one more picture, and that is this. This picture was taken at Spiral Jetty 2008, uh, when I had the pleasure of visiting Utah, and here Bonnie Baxter uh, took me and a few others uh, to spiral jetty. I was not in very good shape then. I was heavily jet lagged, uh, hardly descended from the plane and I was already taken to this uh, tour to spiral jetty. In any case, I had the opportunity to visit your beautiful places and I hope to host one day also Bonnie and uh, Jamie and other people from uh, Great Salt Lake from your institute so um, I'm looking forward to this. So that's my story. Um, let's start uh, with the, uh, let's end with the solution to the uh, little quiz that I gave. Did anyone guess where this came from? I didn't see any guesses on that. Okay. Not yet. There's one. So, Terry has Terry has one. He's yeah. Oh, sorry. Terry? Terry's throwing out William Blake. You would throw out a Brit, wouldn't you? William Blake. <laughs> no. Um, I oh. give you a hint. <laughs> I give you a hint. I give you a hint. Now, any idea? Which Walt famous Disney? Hmm? <laughs> Walt Disney? <laughs> No, <laughs> I put this whale here because of the author of this poem. Oh, oh, several people are saying Herman Melville. Yes, 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 yes. Go Susan this is, and Etienne. This is who? Who uh, Etienne, said? Uh, Etienne Denevoom okay. and, okay. and Susan Dyer. Who, who, okay, <laughs> who, happened, who happens to be my brother, by the way. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh Etienne. <laughs> so indeed, this comes from uh, Herman Melville, Carol, a poem and pilgrimage to the Holy Land, 1876. 
so that's the solution to my uh, little quiz. Uh, I'm ready for questions now. Okay, stop sharing your screen so we can see your face. Wonderful. Wonderful. There was one question about the mixing experiment with the Red Sea um, and the Dead Sea. And Aaron, I keyed up um, a couple of images that you sent me. Do you have your permission to share some pictures of the ponds? And you could just say a word about that. Um, that means that you want me to talk about biology. Oh, no, you don't and, have to talk about biology, and, really. And those ponds, and those ponds are where biological experiments. So if you want me to talk about biology of the Dead Sea with pleasure, but I did not give any introduction about Dead Sea biology. So uh, on it purpose. Could, but couldn't you talk about color and aesthetics? <laughs> <laughs> you like colors, I know. Ah, OK, OK. <laughs> um, Microbiology of uh, salt lakes, and you people at uh, Great Salt Lake know this very well, is always associated with beautiful colors. If today you go to the northern air arm, the north arm of the Great Salt Lake, you see those brines uh, being purple red. And these purple red brines we also witnessed in the Dead Sea at least twice. I saw this in 1980, I saw this in 1992 after very rainy winters. Uh, and um, this is biology. These are special uh, types of bacteria or archaea as we call them. Uh, Bonnie is one of the famous researchers who studies them. Um, and uh, when we uh, were thinking about uh, this idea of connecting the Dead Sea with either the Mediterranean or the Red Sea. Uh, we did all kinds of simulation experiments, mixing two kinds of waters uh, to see what uh, might happen uh, if indeed such a program is implemented. Um, green algae that, that you just showed me. Um, so that's why we put these uh, simulation experiments. And uh, there was one slide that I showed with these sinkholes. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of these sinkholes also become uh, populated by different microorganisms. Again, this is a completely different topic. Uh, I uh, have often talked about the biology of the Dead Sea. Uh, well, if we, you want we, me... won't, we won't make you do that today, but I, I did today. think um, because you said that project had been abandoned and someone asked a question about it, I just thought it was interesting how you had been involved in that um, at that time. That was kind of curious. Not only that, it was the reason how I got involved in Halo Files at all. Really? Uh, yes. Um, it started like this. I did my PhD uh, on biophysics, biochemistry of uh, cyanobacteria, sulfur metabolism. Mm -hmm. Uh, and when I finished my PhD uh, in, when was this, 1978, 1979, uh, one day the director of my institute uh, called me and said, now our government is uh, contemplating a program to connect the Dead Sea with the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. We have already lots of uh, studies about geology, chemistry, physics, but uh, we also should have a biologist uh, looking into what, first of all, what happens today in the Dead Sea and what might happen for better or for worse mm -hmm. if the Dead Sea will be connected to either the Mediterranean or the Red Sea. And he asked me, are you interested in um, getting into such a project? And I said, why not? So yeah. I started working on uh, studying the Dead Sea in 1980 which was uh, a very lucky time. For 1980, it was exactly after one of those rainy winters when there was uh, lots of dilution and we got a red bloom of microorganisms to Dead Sea. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that, then I knew this is an interesting field of uh, study and uh, that's why I got into the Halo files uh, from the beginning. If uh, hypothetically, 
I would have started this not in 1980, but in 1984 or 85 or 86, uh, I would see an almost sterile lake. And after a few months, I probably would have said the Dead Sea is not an interesting uh, object for study. Wow. Let's okay. find another topic to devote my life to. Oh, wow. Interesting. So interesting. It, was, uh, it was a piece of luck, the right place and the right time, especially the right time. Very interesting. Jamie, do you want to read that other question from Michael Vandenberg at Utah Geologic Survey, which Aaron, yeah, he's a, Aaron heard his talk, so he'll, he'll be excited. Yeah, Michael's all about the microbialites. Um, is there any evidence of past growth of microbialites at the Dead Sea, maybe associated with high stands, lower salinity, and um, geologic time scale? Um, Yes and no. Um, in any case, I am not, uh, I already said I'm a lousy geologist. I understand very little about geological timescales and geological processes. Um, on the other hand, we do know that there were periods with uh, lower salinity, higher salinity. And um, when was this? I think about 10 years ago, maybe 50 years ago, there was a deep drilling uh, projects in the Dead Sea, and there uh, have been two, if I remember well, two uh, deep cores collected. And these cores have been an analyzed also for microorganisms, uh, including ancient DNA, etc. I was not involved in uh, uh, any of those studies, but uh, there are data about, uh, let's say, on the level of 16S, 16S uh, ribosomal RNA, uh, what kind of microorganisms have been uh, found in these uh, cores? I do not have the data in my head. Maybe, uh, I don't know if one of the uh, participants in these studies is online now. Um, I think that Danny UNESCO from Germany got uh, this link. I don't know if he's there. Maybe he can uh, say a few words, but I do not have this data in my head. Well, I will put a picture of you up that you sent Michael and I with these gypsum um, deposits in the, um, in the salt pond, said Eliad. Okay, that's not the Dead Sea. These are commercial salt ponds uh, for extraction of sodium chloride mm -hmm. at the Red Sea. So this is seawater evaporation where uh, before sodium chloride precipitates, you first have precipitation of gypsum. So and do, you this think, is, do you think that gypsum deposits are biologically mediated? Uh, no, I don't think okay. so. Okay. Um, and uh, gypsum deposits um, today the Dead Sea will not deposit any gypsum for the simple reason that there is no sulfate. There is hardly right. any sulfate in the Dead Sea. Uh, be, uh, also, uh, figure out how much sulfate you can dissolve in a brine that has, that has 0.5 mole per liter of calcium. Right. Uh, right. So uh, sulfate is not soluble. On the other hand, um, those experiments planning what might happen if you connect the Dead Sea with uh, the normal ocean Mediterranean or the Red Sea, the Dead Sea has all the calcium, seawater has 28 mm -hmm. millimol per liter of sulfate, mm -hmm. and if you mix those, this is a good recipe to get precipitation of calcium sulfate okay. as gypsum. Yeah, absolutely. And the, and the question is then how much gypsum will precipitate, whether this gypsum will precipitate uh, as big crystals that will sink to the bottom, or whether the, the entire Dead Sea will be a milky suspension of tiny crystals that uh, stay there. So yeah. these topics have been topics of uh, serious research and there are lots of publications relevant to this. Um, but as I said, today, I don't think that at the political level, any of the countries involved is still really interested in uh, 
uh, continuing this uh, kind of, of scheme. It's simply too expensive, too risky environmentally, and uh, to what extent uh, you will get uh, uh, valuable results out of this is also not very clear. Yeah, yeah. Excellent, excellent answer. Thank you for talking through those experiments. Very good. Um, I've really enjoyed hearing from you. I've seen a lot of thank yous in the chat. Um, so uh, Jamie, anything you wanna to say to sign off? A little reminder about Saturday or? No, uh, come, come on out to Great Salt Lake on Saturday um, to Antelope Island and the visitor center from three to five and hear me read probably a really horrible poem, but I still will do it. <laughs> and and um, follow us on social media. That's where we're doing a lot of our um, outreach and um, kind of updates. So thank you for coming. We will post this on YouTube um, right after this and um, we will join you for more Salty Shorts later. Thank you from okay. Great Salt Lake Institute. Cheers. Good.